I shouldn't have to say this, given the title of the video, but I'm going to spoil everything about Rain World and its DLC. There's also much dialogue throughout this video. I've done my best to put it all together into a cohesive story, but there may be times where I've had to choose between different outcomes. I've done my best to pick the canon dialogue. The story of Rain World is not one that is given to you overtly. There isn't a character that wakes you up and takes you by the hand to the next quest giver. Your journey instead starts cold and alone, having just fallen down into a raging torrent so strong it swept you miles from your family. As you make your way back home through this hostile land, you uncover its mysteries. Today, I'm here to walk you through those mysteries and the history of this world in the order it occurred. Our story starts with the Ancients, a long-gone race we never actually see throughout the game, though everything in the game does revolve around their actions. But in order to understand their actions, we must first understand the world in which they live. In typical science fiction fashion, their world is vastly different from ours in most ways, with little glimpses of similarities we can relate to. Our information about this world comes almost exclusively from what we can read of their old, discarded data pearls. There are many things contained within these, but perhaps the most relevant one is this. In this world, instead of death being the end of all things, it is simply a continuation. Its entire memory is filled with a mantra repeated 5,061 times, and then a termination verse. It was worn as an amulet, probably together with many identical others forming a pattern on some garment. The repeating mantra is important because it symbolizes the cyclical nature of life and death, and the termination verse is a symbol for ascension above and beyond it. I don't know how familiar you are with the nature of life and death, but I imagine, like all living creatures, you have some intuitive knowledge. Then you know that death isn't the end. Birth and death are connected to each other, like a ring, or some say a spiral. Some say a spiral that in turn forms a ring. Some ramble in agonizing longevity. But the basis is agreed upon. Like sleep, like death, you wake up again, whether you want to or not. This is true for all living things, but some actually break the cycle. That doesn't apply to you or me, though. You are too entangled in your animal struggles. And for me, not breaking that cycle is an integral part of the design. Our mantras keep repeating. Though we lack any concrete explanation on the logistics of this cycle, there are small pieces of information we can use to form theories on how it works. Most important of which being that when you are reborn, you are not reborn into the cycle from which you departed. One of the few things we know for sure is that regardless of its specific nature, the cycle was unpleasant, for the ancients desperately desired to escape it. The ancients, to our knowledge, were not too dissimilar to humans. While we may not know exactly how they looked, we know that they had similar, though far superior, technology. They had factories, they had filtration systems and drills, they had genetic modification, referred to as purposed organisms, and perhaps most of all, they had the iterators. Massive superstructures so large that their cities were built on top of them, leaving the surface world behind. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. The ancients also held deep religious convictions, no doubt arising from their knowledge of the cycle and desire to leave it. Religious groupings started to crop up, and the general belief seems to have been that in order to leave the cycle, one must shed their earthly desires. Each of the various symbols found throughout the game, referred to as karma symbols, corresponds to one of these earthly tethers, but there isn't particularly a need to go into those here and now. This is how the ancients attempted to achieve their ascension until they discovered the Void Fluid, and inevitably, the Void Sea. 
If you leave a stone on the ground and come back sometime later, it's covered in dust. This happens everywhere, and over several lifetimes of creatures such as you, the ground slowly builds upwards. So why doesn't the ground collide with the sky? Because far down, under the very, very old layers of Earth, the rock is being dissolved or removed. The entity which does this is known as the Void Sea. If you drill far enough into the Earth, you begin encountering a substance called Void Fluid. The deeper you go, the less rock and more Void Fluid. It's believed that there is a point where the rock completely gives way. Below that would be the Void Sea. When that stone you placed on the ground has finally done its time in the sediments, it meets the void fluid and is dissolved, leaving the physical world. My creators, or rather my creators' ancestors, figured out a way to use void fluid. The void fluid drills were what started the big technological leap. As you can see, the ancients weren't always so technologically ahead of us. This advancement was instead spurred on by the discovery of the void fluid and the energy it was able to produce. The early ages of the void fluid revolution were an explosive period of innovation and industry. By creating a vacuum of empty space and inducing a flux in the energy fields around the singular null point you've created, you can cause a fuel mass of base elements to decompose into energy. This process is called mass rarefaction. The ancient civilization boomed with this new energy source, creating better drills to dig just a bit deeper, better filters to purify the sediment from the void fluid, and more energy to power these necessities. However, it wasn't long before the ancients realized that they could use the void fluid to solve their greatest problem and escape the tethers of this world without the need to shed their mortal vices. It is basically an instruction on how to starve yourself on herbal tea and gravel, but disguised as a poem. Now, of course, when void fluid was discovered, these methods proved obsolete, as it was more easy just jumping in and out of it to effortlessly leave this world behind. There were some horror stories, though, that if your ego was big enough, not even the void fluid could entirely cross you out, and a faint echo of your pompousness would grandiosely haunt the premises forever. So even when the void fluid baths became cheaper, some would still starve and drink the bitter tea. This put the ancients who were unwilling to follow the religious path in a bit of a tough situation. The void fluid was no longer an easy way out, but instead a risky alternative. This prompted the design and creation of the iterators. Massive, computer-like, purposed organisms, both mechanical and biological, with cities on top for them to inhabit. These iterators, while also handling the logistics of their creator's needs, had one primary goal. Iterate solutions to the mystery of ascension and provide a viable solution in the form of the triple affirmative. Affirmative that a solution has been found affirmative that a solution is portable, and affirmative that a technical implementation is possible and generally applicable. But supercomputers run hot, and supercomputers need cooling. Water is the most important resource for a basic function. Most of our processing is outsourced to microbe strata, which need a flow of clean water or else slag builds up. Our processes cease, and eventually we die. It is very painful. They used to say that an iterator drinks a river, but neither of us two have seen a natural river, so I suppose the analogy is lost on us. Originally, water supply was very important when placing iterators. Later, there would be a great equalizer, the fact that we breathe out as much vapor as we inhale water led to there being water available everywhere, and the last few generations could be placed almost completely freely. The heat from these vapors, this rain, caused the world below to become muddy with thick plant life, and between the cooling cycles of the iterators, life on the surface flourished. But when the rain hit, it was disastrous. The surface beyond the facility walls is a sea of mud, ruin, and thick plant life. The ground out there is almost like water, 
and few things remain stable. Ancient structures uncovered by fissures only to become buried again. Yet the ancients toiled away, unaware or uncaring of the changes they made to the world below. They created more and more iterators and more and more cities. Eventually, the consequences arose. Looks to the moon, one of two main iterators we directly interact with in our story was not designed with certain concerns in mind, as she was one of the earlier models. Thus, the ancients inhabiting her chose to build another iterator very close by, sharing a water supply. This had never been done before, and the fallout of this decision will echo through the coming stories. I exist as an old model, and the concept of an iterator was still fairly new at the time of my construction. Knowledge of the technology, and more important, its limits, had not quite reached maturity. As a result, Certain oversights were made in the long-term scalability and sustainability of some of my functions. And after some time, my facility could no longer keep up with the supply demands necessitated for the life of my city's inhabitants. I suppose if it weren't for these oversights, Five Pebbles would likely never have been built. That is a strange thought. We don't fully understand what happens next. There's a gap in the history. The ancients, in one way or another, disappear. They no longer exist by the time we enter the story. A simple little creature, the likely descendant of a purposed organism designed to clean pipes. The iterators are still toiling away with their great problem despite having no one to solve it for but themselves. Toiling away at a great problem passed down to us from our creators. Debating, testing, calculating, researching. Thousands of us. Our creators chose to abandon us. Taking a gamble and vanishing from the world. Leaving us behind to simply keep working on their problems. If you found everything you heard interesting enough so far that you want to play the game and discover this world for yourself, now is the time to leave. Bookmark my video, thumbs up it if you like, and come back to it later. It'll still be here, I promise. Now the main story you're likely to play first does start with our little white creature, known as a slug cat, getting separated from its family. But we're going to start a bit further back with the earliest one in the timeline. I can't stop dwelling over mistakes that I've made. I could just delete those memories, of course, but that feels... irresponsible. Well, what kind of mistakes are we talking about here? I once gave someone some... sensitive information. The kind that could be dangerous if acted on. Yet I should have known they weren't in the right state of mind to use that information responsibly. I take it you won't tell me the content or to who? No, I will not. Out of respect. Look, if you ever want to talk about it, I can. We can share this little problem of yours. We were made to solve them after all. You're worried they're going to get themselves hurt by messing it up? They already have. It's pretty clear to me who you're talking about. Though I won't say who out of respect. Please don't mock me. This is serious. The fact is, he really looked up to me. As much as I gave him a hard time. That's not something I took lightly. You're not the only one worried about him. I understand your position, but blaming yourself isn't productive. I understand that. I truly do. At this point, we need to be taking action. I agree, but unfortunately there's not much that we can do being locked up in a box. Even less so that he's cut off all communication and is rejecting all help from the outside world. That may not be an issue, necessarily. I've already set a certain plan in motion. Our journey starts as the gate coming from the outer expanse closes behind us. We've made it inside the wall surrounding five pebbles and looks to the moon. A messenger, 
sent by seven red sons with a data pearl stored inside and accompanied by one of Sun's overseers, a small robot-like hologram entity that can keep a watchful eye. The messenger, the seventh of its kind, nearing the climax of a very dangerous journey. Seven Red Suns is not the originator of this messenger idea, it would seem, as more intercepted broadcasts indicate that no significant harassment was the first to purpose organisms for such a task. Do you know how I sent the sensitive information last time? It certainly wasn't over the broadcast network. I purposed a messenger and sent the information by land via a data pearl. How original of you. I learned from the best. At least I used it for something more... practical. If you call that practical, sure. Look how well things turned out. Regardless, the fact is the method worked fine last time. The info was delivered and the messenger even returned safely. So, I've recently sent it out again to deliver another message, despite the closed communication lines. With how this situation has evolved, that's going to be quite the dangerous trip compared to before. Again, that may not be an issue. I've outfitted my messenger with all it needs to protect itself. Tell me more about this messenger. Do they have a name? Well, their test number is 07, so I guess that would be their name. That name doesn't have much personality, though, does it? Don't you think something else might be better? You're not wrong on that. More of a placeholder than anything. I'll think of some ideas for a name. You shouldn't do that until they return to you. Don't get too ahead of yourself. You're right. Perhaps just Messenger is best. For now. The sensitive information Seven Red Suns mentioned sending in the past was delivered in the same way, by the same messenger, and to the same recipient. It is worth noting that the data stored on the data pearls is not transcribed by our character, but instead by the iterators themselves as we interact with them. As I've been reading the data on these pearls to you, I have been choosing the most relevant interpretation. In this specific case though, and mostly going forward, both are equally relevant, as they provide an important difference in perspective. This was a gift from a close friend. It is instructions on how to remove the self-destruction taboo. We are not built to ascend like our creators. It is our role to think, to guide the lesser creatures of the world onto a path towards it. However, a definitive solution has not been found. While the equipment to find one decays, it seems my kind have collectively accepted to remain trapped inside of our creator's puzzle. Meanwhile, the answer remains locked behind their sanctioned taboos. I regret what has happened, but I cannot go back now. Not after what I've done. I need to fix this and try again. If I can just reproduce Sliver of Straw's results, they will understand. I was so close. This information is illegal. Someone probably tried to send it by a pearl somehow, rather than risking being overheard on broadcast. It's an instruction on how to circumvent the self-destruction taboo. The problem with breaking taboos is that the barriers are encoded in every cell of our organic parts, and there are other taboos strictly regulating our ability to rewrite our own genome. So what you need is to somehow create a small sample of living organic matter, which can procreate and act on the rest of your organic matter to rewrite its genome. The rewrite has to be very specific, overriding the specific taboo you want to circumvent, but do nothing else. The method described here is about scrambling the genome of standard plastic neural tissue with temperature fluctuations. After each scramble, you browse the resulting cells for the genome you're after. This, of course, is extremely time-consuming, unless you run a big number of parallel processes. I definitely don't have any experience with this, but to me it would seem that too many parallel processes would be quite dangerous as it would be exponentially more difficult to manage and control them all. The whole operation seems rather risky if you ask me. 
Wait, who is Sliver of Straw? Do you know Sliver of Straw? She's quite legendary among us. Sliver of Straw is the only one to ever broadcast a specific signal. That the big problem we've all been working on has been solved. The triple affirmative. She's also one of the few that has ever been confirmed as exhaustively incapacitated or dead. We do not die easily. Everyone has a theory. Some say that she did have a solution, but that the solution itself was somehow dangerous. These later became known as the Triangulators, who think that a solution should be inferred without being directly discovered. Some said she never had a solution, she just died, and when the system broke down, an erroneous signal was sent. One camp claimed that dying was the solution. The last claim is the one we're interested in, as it is the belief that five pebbles held. This is something we can confirm from conversations in anonymous sliverist groups, from a user going by the pseudonym Erratic Pulse. Ah, I wouldn't necessarily disagree. Sliver of Straw was a traitor to the cause. Sliver of Straw broke the self-destruction tabu. How did this idiot get in here? Kick him out. I think they had a point. Ah, really? Elaborate. It was definitely coming from an idiotic state of mind, but there is something to it. Why is it that even in a closed Sliverist group, the self-destruction taboo is held so high, while Sliver of Straw herself evidently is not among us anymore? Wait now! I'm just saying that for all the research we are doing, all the theories we have, it's strange that we leave this path untrod. It is not a new idea, but it needs to be vented occasionally. What if there is no universal solution? What if perception is in fact existence, and when Sliver of Straw sent the triple positive, it was not a mistake? What if crossing oneself out, or even just death, is the way? We need to consider the possibility. This is a log of a Sliverist conversation group. Some of the replies are mine, but none of that is important now. I don't imagine a beast like you would have any understanding of who Sliver of Straw is, or what she means to me and many others. She is the only one of us to send the signal that the answer to our creator's problem has been found. A universal solution for global ascension. Unfortunately, she is also the only one of our kind to be confirmed as dead, something our creators had taken great measures to prevent. It is near impossible for us to expire through mundane means. It was clear to me and few others what this meant. The liver of straw had opened the door for us. We only needed to reject the restrictions of our creators to follow her. If only they could see that. There was nothing that could be done to convince them. They were too deep in theory and tradition. The only path forwards is to lead by example. To prove Sliver of Straw's death was not just a coincidence. The pseudonym is likely taken from a private conversation with Seven Red Sons. Now it's important that we understand the nature of their relationship to truly understand the gravity of what is to come. Can I tell you something? Lately, I'm tired of trying and trying, and angry that they left us here. The anger makes me even less inclined to solve their puzzle for them. Why do we do this? Yes, I'll spell it out. Not because you're stupid or naive. Also, not saying that you're not. Please, I'm coming to you for guidance. Sorry, very sorry. I kid. Fact is, of course we are all aware of the evident futility of this big task. It's not said out loud, but if you were better at reading between the lines, there's nowhere you wouldn't see it. We're all frustrated. So why do we continue? We assemble work groups, we wonder, we iterate and try, some of us die, it's not fair. Cause there's not any options. What else can we do? You're stuck in your can, and at any moment you have no more than two alternatives. Do nothing, or work like you're supposed to. An analogy. 
you have a maze and you have a handful of bugs. You put the bugs in the maze and you leave. Given infinite time, one of the bugs will find a way out if they just erratically try and try. This is why they call us iterators. But we do die of old age. Even more incentives. You know that nothing ever truly dies though, around and around it goes. Granted our tools and resources get worse over time, but that is theoretically unproblematic. Because in time, even a minuscule chance will strike a positive. All the same to them, they're not around anymore. I struggle to accept being a bug. This is an old conversation between myself and a close friend who I considered a mentor. We have... not spoken for a long time now. I can't bring myself to do so, not after what happened between us. None of them understood my theories, but sons. They trusted me. They risked so much trying to help me, and I hurt them. It's only now, after I've had so much time to think on it, that I understand why I was so angry. I lashed out because out of everyone, they were the last individual I wanted to confront me about my mistakes. I can't go back now. All I can try to do is recover and try again. I have to. And so Seven Red Suns sends this forbidden data to Five Pebbles. Instructions on how to circumvent the self-destruction taboo by essentially creating a purposed organism with that specific task. Now, no one can reach him or his neighbor looks to the moon. Have you had any contact with Five Pebbles recently? Not in a long while, actually, unless worrying about him counts. One of his neighbors, Unparalleled Innocence, sent an overseer to his can and got some images. They were made public in the local group, in an effort to be mean, I suppose. There is no other way of putting it, he looks awful. Tell me. He's got the rot. Very badly. Big cysts have become mobile and are scattering down the west and middle legs. He does listen to you, and few others by now, so you should talk to him. I will try to contact him. Does Moon know? Moon has been unavailable for some time. Two cycles ago, my neighbor Five Pebbles drastically increased his water consumption to four times the normal amount. He has been unresponsive for a period of time longer than that. The two of us share groundwater, and I have been without water for almost a cycle. Any attempts at communication have been met with complete silence, and my situation is becoming increasingly dangerous. I am asking the local group for information about when you were last able to contact him, and to try to use those same communication channels again, repeatedly, until you get a response. I will be clear on this. If he is not persuaded to stop whatever it is he is doing, I will die. Before that happens, I will utilize my seniority privilege and use forced communications, hoping to shake him out of it. Forced communications in the network will be unpleasant for all, and I will wait as long as possible before I turn to that option. If anyone is, is receiving messages, I'm not sure what to do. Please respond. I'm worried right now, to be honest. Why is that? It's about looks to the moon. She's very close to Five Pebbles, and she's a very dear friend of mine. Oh, right. No one has been able to contact her since... Exactly. She wouldn't willingly tune us out. I worry that her systems are incredibly damaged. There isn't much we can do, is there? We'll just have to try to help her the best we can. For now, I'm going to hold out hope that she'll eventually respond. What if she doesn't? I may send a little care package if things get desperate enough. Back to our messenger, we arrive at Looks to the Moon. She gives us the mark of communication, the ability to understand what the iterators are saying, though we're unable to communicate back, and explains the situation to us. Though it is... 
difficult for her with her structure failing. Brave messenger, what are you? I could read the data contained in your body, but the process could take several cycles. Time I very sadly lack. I could remove the pearl from you, but the process would be very unpleasant for you. I also do not believe the contents within it are directed to me. If you are indeed a messenger, then I urge you to move on. There is... There is a... 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 There is another like me near here. His name is Five Pebbles. Please, hurry to a structure. I am unable to calm him, and his excessive output is causing irreversible damage to my own structure. I don't know how long I will continue to even stand. There is an elevated cable linking our installations. Crossing that bridge is safer than attempting to scale Five Pebbles from the ground up. Hurry, little messenger. Crossing the bridge that was originally created to move the ancients from city to city, we arrive at Five Pebbles. The unfortunate development of his failed experiment has already started to spread around his facility. The cause of this failure? A forced broadcast. Immediately lower your groundwater consumption to one-fifth of the current intake. Stop whatever it is you are doing. Please stop. As your local group senior, I order you. Yo, 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 yo. As your senior, senior, I plead. Stop. You could not have chosen a worse moment to disturb me. You've ruined everything. Please. I almost had it. I will never forget this. When precisely this forced broadcast happened is a bit unclear. It's safe to assume it happened before our messenger was sent out, however. And so our messenger arrives at Five Pebbles himself. Sons, why did you send the messenger here again? Please leave. I cannot afford any further distractions. I'm the only one who can fix this now. I trust that you understand me. You've brought your overseer all this way. The least I can do is read your message aloud for it. Pebbles, I send you this message as your concerned and longtime friend. Unparalleled Innocence had sent an overseer to your can, and we've all observed the state that you are in. I know this is my fault. I should have foreseen you'd be too desperate to escape your situation to do things in proper moderation. For that, I'm very, very sorry. However, please don't disable your communication modules. You don't have to go through this alone. Everyone has been trying to contact you. We only want to help you. The behavior from your can has become erratic. It's not healthy, and it's not going to solve your problems. We've lost all communications from Moon as well and have reason to believe her facility may be suffering irreversible damage from your attempts to fix yourself. I know better than anyone how you can be about these things, but it doesn't have to happen this way. Please respond back. Astounding. You could never understand what I feel right now, being pitied and lectured like this. What use would your help be? Your benevolent charity is what got me here in the first place. I wanted to find my own way out, and now I sit here rotting because of you and Moon. I'm not just another bug wandering your worthless maze. I will reach my own solution without any of you. Get out. Get out. 
Oh no. What is the matter? I'm sorry. I need a moment. Seven Red Suns, are you okay? The messenger made it to Five Pebbles. He... He was so furious. The pearl was inside of the messenger's chest. Last time, Five Pebbles was very gentle and careful with removing it. This time, he simply slashed open the chest and ripped the pearl out. The messenger was struggling to stand. They're sturdy creatures. I'm sure it'll heal over time. You have to have more faith. You're right. I guess I'm just scared of losing them. I've grown more attached than I could have expected. I lost them as well. Don't know what I'd do. So what's your plan now? Did you have a backup mission for your messenger, or are you just bringing it back home? No, it's over. Tell the truth, I don't even know if the messenger survived. How could you not know? Aren't you surveying the situation with your overseers? Pebbles destroyed the overseer I sent into his can. Then shortly afterwards I lost communication with the rest of my overseers inside his facility. He must have applied a facility-wide lockdown. That's quite a desperate measure. I know he's tired of being spied on, but is he allowed to do that? There's no rules anymore. Who's going to stop him? You realize this is very bad news, right? That just complicates the issue further. Your plan was a complete failure. While no significant harassment desperately tries to reach looks to the moon, our messenger sits alone, trying to recover. Moon, it's me again. I do not know if you are receiving these. Please signal in any way you can. I need to talk to you. I need to know you're okay. It's difficult for us to assist you over this distance. Even more difficult for us to do anything in the midst of these tantrums. We're going to try everything that we can. Just hold on a little longer. No longer guided by an overseer and unsure of where to go, Eventually, our dear messenger makes its way back to Looks to the Moon, with the pearl it had ripped from its chest. What is this pearl you've brought along with you? It has strange biological attachments. Was this pearl from inside of you? Let me take a look at what's written on it. This is... I assume you've already shown this to Five Pebbles? I was not aware of the extent to which these affairs had reached the wider iterator populace, nor was I aware of the lengths that the others were going in their attempts to get in contact with us. If only I could. Brave Messenger, do you mind if I rewrite the contents of this pearl? After all, it has already served its original purpose. I will attach a broadcast key to it, signed with my communication serial. To the west of here, past the silently towering chimney stacks of Five Pebbles Complex, you will find a place of sun-baked lands with beautiful flora that straddle the clouds. There is a communications array located there. It is the nearest one that may still be functioning. Its systems should recognize and respond to my signed broadcast key. If you could please stop there on your return trip to Seven Red Suns, I would be very grateful. This is my only hope to get a message out to the local group. Be careful, messenger. I just don't understand. Why hasn't Moon done anything about the situation herself? He was appointed as Pebble Superior. She has the power to stop him. I've been very close with Moon, and I can tell you she is incredibly caring. And while her kindness is one of her greatest attributes, it is also to her detriment. Isn't this excessive, though? Surely she at least has a sense of self-preservation. I'm sure she convinced herself that she could help Pebbles, that she could bring him under control with words rather than forced action. She's probably still trying that now unless her systems have degraded past the point of even allowing that. That's why this is so tragic to me. Please. Respond. 
you, you, you cannot, or, or not blockable. I know you're feeding me. Please stop messaging me. I cannot help you. I cannot even help myself. As promised, as much as the little creature can anyway, our messenger climbs to the top of the communications array on the way home, delivering looks to the moon's final message. The broadcast goes off. This will be my final broadcast to the local group. Within several cycles, my structure's legs will fail. Even if five pebbles were to calm, the damage has already been done. I can only hope that someday you will all find the answer to our great question. I do not think I will see that day. I want to thank everyone for trying so hard. It means a lot to me that you would all go to such lengths. I can't excuse his actions, but I understand his frustration. We all share that. I only wish we had a chance to speak one last time. Thank you, everyone. I'm happy to not be alone. And we see our messenger safe again in the arms of seven red suns. Sometime after our messenger has returned home, we meet a new character. A crimson slug cat with a scar known as the Artificer. The Artificer's journey is mostly inconsequential to the larger story, so I'll keep the summary rather short, but there are some important elements. The Artificer is violent and dangerous, but you likely would be too if you had been through similar. At the start of the journey, we find the Artificer violently dispatching a group of scavengers and coming across a small citizen ID drone, lovingly named Sephantheal by the game's community. The Artificer is unable to gain karma by any natural means, instead being bound to the lowest symbol, the one representing Wrath. It makes its way through karma gates using the bodies of whatever scavengers are unfortunate enough to cross its path. As the Artificer rips through their ranks, we discover that they at one point had two slug pups. I think you can infer what happened here but the memories don't provide you with that luxury. Instead, you get to watch as the scavengers chase them down and violently execute them for the simple sin of curiosity, taking a pearl without knowing any better. And thus we understand the Artificer's rage. As does another important character, Five Pebbles. Is this reaching you? I suppose it was only a matter of time before you ended up here. Your journey throughout my facility grounds has been incessantly brought to my attention by my overseers thanks to the device that follows you. It is the Citizen ID drone of one of my long departed creators. It seems to have been damaged and imprinted itself with you on reactivation. Much of the data on the drone has been corrupted. Allow me to do my duty as an iterator and rethink it to my structure. Little ruffian, you are stuck in a cycle, a repeating pattern. I assume you have come here because you want a way out. However, there is little I can do. A primal urge, one that tears from deep inside your very core, keeps you bound here. Even with my divine influence, there is nothing that can be done. However, if you intend to carry that device around and masquerade as one of my citizens, then perhaps you can at least properly perform your responsibility of tending to this superstructure. From the glimpses I've been shown of your journey so far, it is apparent you have a need to inflict violence against the scavenger population. 
While I find your way of life appalling, it seems we share a common enemy. A large pack of them has made a home in my city and have been causing progressive damage to the roof of my structure in their attempts to gather scrap metal and other mechanical parts. As my dutiful citizen, I would encourage you to return home to your city and pay them a visit. Perhaps in that way we can both depart from this interaction with something we desire. But unless you have something interesting to show or to bring me, it is time for you to leave. If the Artificer chooses to return to Five Pebbles after completing the mission, he has this to say. Ah, you've returned. You know that I care very little for the creatures that wander through my facility. In your current state, I can only assume that you have found what you were looking for. For your own sake, I hope it was worth your struggle. Now please leave. I would prefer to be alone. If you wish, though, there is another path. The Artificer is able to encounter the Echoes, something we'll go into more detail on later, and eventually ascend, letting go of the grudge and seeing the pups again one last time. It's unclear which ending is canon, though I'm inclined to believe it's the first one, as the Ascension endings are usually the non-canon endings. And that is how we'll leave our Artificer and five pebbles, as we turn our focus to a new slug cat sometime in the future. Do you suppose you'll ever raise another messenger? If the need arises, I certainly would. After all, I started investigating the method out of the inevitability of our situation. We are all slowly dying. By some miracle, our broadcast networks are still functioning. There will come a time when they too will degrade into a lifeless prop. When that time comes, we need alternate methods of communication. Well, so far it seems the method at least has some efficacy. We can at least say we were able to make a valiant effort to try to save Big Sister Moon. I'm tempted to start work on raising another messenger as a last-ditch effort, but to be honest, I don't think there's any point. Not to be a pessimist, but at this rate, there will be nothing left of Moon by the time that messenger would be ready to be sent out. There's nothing better for me to do with my time, though. Good luck with that. I'll keep you updated as to whether my messenger ever makes a return. Sometime in the future, after the collapse of Looks to the Moon and the story of the Artificer, no significant harassment sends out a new messenger with a very special package. A neuron containing slag keys. This messenger, unlike the others, has a strict time limit though. Whether through the desperation of not having enough time to properly purpose it, or simply an error on no significant harassment's part, this slug cat is very sick. Arriving at Five Pebbles gives us slightly different dialogue depending on whether or not the hunter has made their delivery. Let us see what you have here. Eleven. No. Sixteen. Sixteen slag reset keys. However, it seems this delivery was not intended for me. Everything suggests it was tailored for the specific predicaments of a friend of mine. Her name is Looks to the Moon, and her state is considerably worse than mine. She's a short distance to the east of here, much shorter than customary, a circumstance that has led to some difficulties between us. I am not without responsibility for her situation. It would only be suiting that I aided in this... rescue mission. As other endeavors have proven futile, I'm not ashamed to admit I've become more invested in day-to-day -day matters. I will do what I can to assist you. 
unless you are aware you are not well. I was not a medical facility even when the equipment was functioning, but I will attempt to do something to buy you a little time. You do not have much time. It is admirable what you choose to do with it. Send my regards. You seem to have been in contact with an iterator before, so perhaps you are already aware. You and I have something in common, little creature. We both have something... unfortunate growing in us. In my case, there is not much to be done. For you, however, there might be a way. The old path. Go to the west past the farm arrays and then down into the earth where the land fissures, as deep as you can reach, where the ancients built their temples and danced their silly rituals. I will give you something that might be of help. I suggest you hurry. As the hunter arrives at looks to the moon, we see her motionless on her chamber floor. Carefully giving her the neuron containing the slag keys will cause her to spring to life, prompting a one-way conversation, much like all the others, with the hunter. Hello. Hello, little creature. You... You did this? One moment. My memory isn't responding. I... I have no idea. Must have been gone for... Oh. Little creature. You are not well. I am so sorry to say, but you do not have much time left. If things are as they seem, thank you. I don't know why you spent your last remaining cycles helping me, but know that I'm deeply grateful. I have known very few beings who could aspire to such a noble thing. You really are an amazing little creature. I wish I could say I will always remember it. Little friend. Perhaps you already know this, and I don't know what consolation it might bring, but you will wake right back up again. While it doesn't seem to be the canon ending, I would be remiss not to mention the Hunter's Ascension ending. If you're able to make it to Five Pebbles and receive the karma he gives you, visit each of the Echoes and learn from their mistakes, and make it all the way down past the farm arrays and into the Earth to the Void Sea, we see a special scene. The Hunter waking up once again in the arms of no significant harassment. The Hunter, for reasons we don't fully understand, is unable to ascend, most likely from the sickness inside it. The canon ending is much darker, though we will have to wait until the next campaign to learn about it, and that does bring us to the next campaign. Far closer together on the timeline than maybe any other pair of slug cats but one, we meet the Gourmand, a rotund little creature on a journey that is once again, mostly inconsequential to the greater story. The reason we're addressing the Gourmand, however, is because of the connections it has to the others. The first by convincing Five Pebbles to open the locked gates to the Outer Expanse. Gluttonous beast, what brings you to my chamber? You are like no other messenger before you. Perhaps I have underestimated the ability for your kind to communicate my existence. I may have been too rash in bestowing the mark of communication upon you. With the recent traffic through my structure, however, I would hesitate to believe that you will be my last encounter with your kind. You have the same problem as everyone else, from the microbes in the processing strata to me who is if you excuse me, godlike in comparison. 
we all want a way out. However, your particular rotundness might well imply how little you seem to care. A simple animal ignorantly accepting its existence. I do not believe my intended purpose will be much help to you. I can, however, encourage you and your kind to leave my facility grounds. Unfortunately, the same locks that were supposed to prevent creatures from getting in will now prevent you from getting out. Perhaps this strategy was ill-conceived after all. Allow me to just... Go west through the underground tunnels at the outskirts of my territory. You will find the gate to the world outside of it now unlocked. In return, I ask that you encourage your community through whatever method of communication you choose to employ to also go west, off into the wastes below, far away from me and my work. Speaking of, on your way out, please use the access shaft. And the second connection, by the discovery of the hunter's final resting place, consumed by its disease. Hello, little creature. Are you lost? I am sorry to say that there's nothing here for you. You've been given the gift of communication, so I can only imagine that you have met five pebbles. You must already understand how little of me remains functional. However, it is nice to have someone to talk to after all this time. My last visitor was very sick, so their visits here were not for very long. I can only hope to remember them for as long as I can in my current state. Maybe you know them? They left some time ago. My last overseer watched them head to the west. Perhaps they were returning home with what little time they had left. You are welcome to stay as long as you desire, little creature. It is nice to have company. It would be a waste of time to talk about the survivor and the monk separately, as their stories are intertwined. You see, while the survivor may be the first slug cat you meet, falling into the surge of water, the monk is their sibling, valiantly jumping in after them. Nothing said to them in their journey through the world has any serious story implications, as these were the main campaigns of the base game before the DLC. It's where you would have learned all the history of the world, with the interactions with the iterators serving only to explain themselves and the nature of the cycle. There are a few inconsequential or non-canon bits of dialogue if you interact with them in specific ways, but they aren't relevant to the main story aside from possibly showing that these neurons floating around the inside of the iterators are their minds and memories. Eating them will prompt special dialogue from looks to the moon, depending on how many are left. Oh, so you returned. Come to take more from me? My memories, my thoughts, just something to fill your stomach? No, never mind. It's useless to be angry at an animal following its instincts. Once, a single neuron meant nothing to me. I see that someone has given you the gift of communication. Must have been five pebbles, as you don't look like you can travel very far. He's sick, you know, being corrupted from the inside by his own experiments. Maybe they all are by now. Who knows? We weren't designed to transcend, and it drives us mad. I'm still angry at you, but it is good to have someone to talk to after all this time. The scavengers aren't exactly good listeners. They do bring me things, though, occasionally. The ends of their respective journeys result in them either making it home, or ascending and leaving the cycle, much like the others. An unknown amount of time passes and we meet a new slug cat, a quick little blue one with gills, the rivulet. Unlike most of the others, we have no real idea where the rivulet is from, though we do know the rivulet is from somewhere as it already possesses the mark of communication, which to our knowledge can only be granted by an iterator. The length of time between downpours has significantly decreased, 
and the rain hammers down hard, flooding and disabling shelters along the way. Oh, hello there. What a strange specimen you are. My memory does not serve me well, but it has been a long time since I've encountered one of your species, and none quite with adaptions such as your own. It appears you can breathe underwater. Amazing. More importantly, I wonder who it is that gave you that mark. It could not have been my neighbor Five Pebbles, as he has been sick for a very long time. These frequent downpours suggest to me an acute failure of his machinery, and in that condition, I doubt any creature could get anywhere near him and still make it back alive. Then, are you from a faraway land? Did you meet no significant harassment? Or perhaps, chasing wind? Or even farther than that? I don't know why you've traveled all this way, but there's nothing for you here. I can only advise you to return to wherever you come from. These lands have become a tremendous hazard, and conditions will only worsen with the passage of time. I hope you understand, my little friend. I don't mean to be discourteous. I am simply fearing for your safety. Ignoring looks to the moon's advice, the rivulet scales five pebbles, narrowly avoiding getting washed away in the process. Upon reaching the top, we confirm what we already suspected. Five Pebbles is on the verge of death, listening to audio coming from a little violet data pearl. That pearl is an old keepsake from times long past. It encodes a recording of a short hymn that was popular among the inhabitants of my city. It is a small comfort that helps drown out the solemn ambience of the surrounding facility and at best gives some remembrances of better times. It's not much, but I don't have a lot to occupy my time with anymore. Depending upon the sequence of events, the dialogue in this section differs. However, I believe it's safe to assume that the first version of events is the canon version. Is this some kind of joke? I have seen your kind here many times before. To each I have paid little attention. I have given them direction and my wisdom. Yet here you stand, another small beast on the floor of my chamber. I have nothing to offer you that you do not already have, nor am I in a state capable of doing so. I cannot help you. I cannot even help myself. Always that same blank expression. Familiarity is a comfort, I suppose. Through whatever chittering or foolish dances your kind uses to communicate my existence, it is clear all of you are quite tenacious. To make the pilgrimage to me is no easy task, even more so through my structure in its current state. I can offer no gifts, nor can I be saved or forgiven for what I have done. If you and your kind choose to meddle in the affairs of passing gods, then I will give you my only request. Deep within the core of this structure is an energy rail that distributes incredible power. This power is drawn from a mass rarefaction cell. Even in my state, a single cell should be enough to help. I ask you this. Remove the cell from its chamber and bring it far to the east to a friend, if she is somehow still alive. Once the cell has been removed, my structure will begin shutting down. The pumps that allowed me to flush the decay from my conduits will stop, and I will slowly die. I cannot run away from my mistakes forever. There is nothing else that can be done now. Please, do this for me. I've made my choice. If, however, the rivulet has already stumbled upon the rarefaction cell, and enters Five Pebbles' chamber with it, he will instead say the following. I cannot help you. I cannot even help myself. And now you have come and taken the only thing that I have left. 
Perhaps this is fate. Arma recounting my deeds and bearing its fangs at me in the most ironic fashion. If your actions are only out of ignorance, then I make a request of you. Take that rarefaction cell with you. Consider it my parting gift after all of the harm I have done to those around me. And myself. I cannot be saved or forgiven, land fish. There is nothing that can be done for me now. Please bring it far to the east. To her. If she is somehow still alive. And for your own sake, never return here. Now, in my opinion, we have no real reason to believe the rivulet would discover the rarefaction cell before being instructed to, and thus it is more likely that the first conversation is the canon one. But there doesn't seem to be any definitive evidence either way, and it doesn't realistically change anything either. Returning to Five Pebbles with the rarefaction cell after being instructed to retrieve it, we receive something perhaps unexpected from him. Gratitude towards a lower life form. Thank you. I suppose this makes us... even? Goodbye, wet mouse. Send my regards. And so the rivulet returns to looks to the moon with her salvation in tow. Oh. What is that, little creature? Oh. This is a deeply concerning discovery. Do you have any idea what this is? These are known as mass rarefaction cells. They are a type of backup energy source that powers our superstructures in times of maintenance, void fluid pipe ruptures, and other general power failures. In the absence of our creators to replace deteriorating parts, these cells have become one of the major components that allow our facilities to remain powered. However, the fact that this cell is currently in my hands can only mean bad things for whoever this originally came from. I sure hope you weren't the one responsible for it becoming misplaced. I know firsthand the tragedy of losing this power. In the wake of my accident, all of my rarefaction cells were dislodged on impact and washed away in the floodwaters. This cell could be valuable to me, but with my umbilical severed, my overseers running free, and all of my facilities laying deep beneath a large body of water, it would be an impossible task to deliver this to a functional location. You might be able to find an access shaft into my lower structure nearby, but I have no idea how much is left of it. Please be careful. The rivulet dives into the bowels of looks to the moon's submerged superstructure, able to survive only through the grace of its happenstance evolution. Or was it in fact designed this way? A purposed organism created by some unknown iterator, the true savior of looks to the moon. We deliver the rarefaction cell and her structure springs to life. Ah! It's like a little one! Did you do this? I feel as if pulled out of a deep sleep. I am still trying to process all of this. It has been so long since I've had a connection like this with my structure. Everything has restarted in maintenance mode. It seems that it has sent out the order for all of my overseers to return. With my umbilical cord broken, I can't operate my structure directly, but with them working as messengers, I've been restoring some of my chamber's functionality. With any luck, I should be able to... Ah! Here we go! There's so much here. So much I've forgotten. I'll never be what I once was. But this... I'm sorry. It's hard to piece all of this together. So much has happened in my absence. I only have unread messages and overseer recordings to make sense of what I've missed. Some of these are even from before my collapse. Incredible. Slag reset keys, a messenger, saving me? No significant harassment was never one to give up easily. However, I still don't understand everything that has happened. Has it all just been coincidence? Did others send help as well? Then there's Five Pebbles. He was sick even before I collapsed and his state must have only deteriorated since. 
It looks like he's barely breathing. If there's any part of him left, I... We were once good friends, despite everything that has happened. He's probably alone and afraid now. I do not run away from my mistakes forever. Please understand. Five Pebbles, what have you done? I've been given so much already, and now you've given all you had left. It does not matter what happened between us. If he still held the same anger he once did, then none of this would be possible. We've been given the chance to make things right, and he deserves to know what he did wasn't pointless. I'm so thankful for everything. This is local group senior, Big Sister Moon. Limited functionality has been restored to some of my basic systems. I've regained access to this communications array for the first time since the collapse. Through my overseers, I have also caught up on some of the current events, including what I've gathered by reading through my messages and equipment manifests. I am already aware of the large extent to which the local infrastructure has deteriorated. I do not know if sending this message will be a futile effort. Even before the collapse, I could not broadcast beyond the extents of my local facility. And so clearly, this forced broadcast is addressed to you, Five Pebbles. Is there any chance I can still reach you, despite the condition we both are in? I need to know. If in any case this message arrives, please signal back if you can find a way. I know it may be uncomfortable for you to address me after all that has happened. We've both had a long time to think things through. Any anger I have had has long since faded. I don't hold anything against you. If anything, we're both in similar dilemmas right now. And as your big sis, you know how protective I am of you. I'm sorry, Five Pebbles. I'll always be here if you need someone to talk to. Well, I wish there was more I could do for you, my time is running out. These ordeals have made me understand what they all tried to tell me. I don't have to go through this alone. So what do you think is going to happen to the world once we all, you know, Discover a reproducible, portable, and global solution for ascension? Or when we all drop dead? Well, in either case, really. I'm not really sure myself. At this point, I think our rain might be the only source of heat on the surface. It has been that way for a very long time. There are so few records of the world before we were made, but it all seems so... Different. Do you think it will someday look like that again? I don't think so. At least not for a very long time. Oh. In the farthest timeline, the world has frozen over. The heat from the iterator's cycles no longer keeping the cold at bay. We meet the final slug cat. It's about time we talk about the echoes. As we know, the ancients, who were unable to let go of the mortal world when entering the Void Sea, were instead tethered to a place in between, as if they were ghosts. We can encounter these echoes throughout our exploration of the world as all of the slug cats, and they will share their wisdom with them, raising their karma level and helping them on the path toward ascension, the slug cats learning from the mistakes of the echoes. Most of what they say would be irrelevant here. Philosophical musings, regrets, or for some, acceptance. Strange. Something still draws me here, even after all this time. The weather is so different now, but the fields. I do not need eyes to know that the grasses still sway gently in the winds. You have grasped at the boundless infinites of the cosmic void. Yet here I am contemplating these same fields as I once did, talking to some sort of rodent. 
Do you see the same as me? Beauty continuing to bloom even in a place long forgotten. I did not have the will to depart, nor the desire. Why did they always search for an escape as if we were imprisoned? What offering from the void could usurp the gift of life already given? This moment right here, it is where we are meant to be. You have no name. I will tell it. I was embalmed, adorned, ready for the journey. So proud. It was jubilation. My name was sung loud and clear. Did they know that I didn't quite leave, didn't quite stay? Did I be ashamed that I linger here? Where my memories are kept. And I'd be ashamed that I now envy your flesh prison. And it is in meeting these echoes and learning of their struggles that the saint discovers its true purpose. But before we can get to that, we need to visit our old friends. Looks to the moon is in better shape than we've seen her in in a long time though she sends us away quickly, seemingly understanding the work we have to do. You feel it too, don't you, strange one? We've only just met, but our perceptions will soon part ways. Go on, our cycles will meet again. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for five pebbles. Little green thing. Hello. Nothing here. Nothing left. Five Pebbles, a godlike supercomputer reduced to this state. One who once spouted annoyance at the slug cats, finding comfort in the company of the only visitor he's had in a long time. Thank you for company. The saint is very unique in that it doesn't seem to have the mark of communication, yet it understands the iterators clearly. Hello. You can understand me, can't you? What an unusual being you are. By what mechanism have you achieved such attunement? It has been a while since I had a life form like you stumble into my chamber. While I'm relieved that some of your species has managed to persist even now, I don't envy your situation. Hopefully you can find an escape to your suffering. You remind me of an old creature who used to visit here often. The passage of time has taken them away, of course. That was a while ago. Stay as long as you'd like, but not too long. This chamber is not very well insulated from the cold. After encountering enough echoes to reach the highest karma level, the true power of the saint is made clear. Whether designed by an iterator or simply a bizarre natural creation of the world, the saint has the ability to remove creatures permanently from the cycle. Thus, as the saint, we travel back to looks to the moon. We travel back to five pebbles and we free them from the bonds of this world. Then, we descend to the Void Sea, or rather, where the Void Sea once was. We find that the filtration system has sunken far further into the earth, many parts of it eaten away, the ancient ruins of the depths long, long gone. How many cycles have passed at this point? Hundreds? Thousands? How long is a cycle? The saint arrives at a new location, Rubicon, a word defined as a bounding or limiting line, one that when crossed commits a person irrevocably. We've encountered the place where things ascended go. It's a dangerous place filled with many aggressive creatures and massive guardians that upon spotting the saint will lock the exits of whichever room you're in. It doesn't matter, 
The saint is too powerful, able to ascend even the guardians. Upon reaching the top, or bottom, of Rubicon, the void sea now hanging above us threateningly, we meet our old friends for the last time. The dialogue that follows will change whether you've ascended looks to the moon, five pebbles, or both. I understand what you are, little beast. This place is not real, a dream from outside, as if every cycle of my existence is knotted together with another's. Even if for only a fraction of a second it ripples through mine. I see my own creation. I see my agonizing decay. I see my hollow structure become a sanctuary in the storm. I see a new world unfold without me as me. I see myself become something else. Yet, I cannot see the beginning or end of your own. An aberrant cycle twisting into mine before spiraling onward into the abyss. What a horrifying destiny you found. Little Saint, I perceive your existence as it passes through my own. I know this is only a dream, but your presence is real. Do you see it too? Our endless repetitions circling onward to infinity? From here I can observe the repeating loop of my own existence, every iteration a duplicate of the last. I have visions of the entire pattern, my creator's desire to escape at once. An endless sequence of life and death, further beyond my control with each passing cycle. Where does your cycle go, little creature? Its edges twist over themselves, like circles within circles. Your cycle consumes itself. What have you become? Do you feel it, old friend? The sensation of time folding in on itself? The spiraling offshoots of another's reality wrapping around your own? None of this is real, is it? Every repeating cycle of our own existence, unwound and laid bare, a cycle pulled into a tangent with itself. Is this what we were looking for? Have we broken free from it? Or is it just a dream? Was the answer always right there? Does the question mean anything to us now that we are here? Perhaps a resolution was never possible from our original frame of reference. The question wasn't well defined. If we had stumbled upon a correct solution among all of our permutations, we wouldn't have had any hope to distinguish it from the faulty ones. Nor did we have a method to reliably test it. We were trying to understand what lies beyond a point of no return while having yet to pass it. Only those who have seen the other side can know the answers. But by definition, they can never venture back to deliver the knowledge they have gained. Perhaps that is why you need to wake up, little visitor. The saint leaves their chamber, the first and only time we see them together. And unlike the many ascensions before us, the saint disappears up into the void sea. The saint encounters the void worm, a massive creature so big that it defies reason. The others have met this creature as well, being observed by it as they passed through. The saint takes notice of its silent observer and attempts to ascend it. The void worm moves through the saint, removing all of its karma levels, and turning it into an echo, where it wakes up once again on the frozen ground of the windswept spires. An aberrant cycle spiraling onward into the abyss. What a horrible destiny we found. There are different ways to interpret this ending. One interpretation, which I will credit to Turtle Toad, a popular Rain World YouTuber and artist for some of the art in Downpour, is that the saint was too proud, believing it was above the cycle itself and that ego is what held it back from ascending. That the saint is the epitome of all the incorrect ways the ancients viewed ascension, trying to 
cheat the system to find any way other than simply letting go, a symbol of why they could never achieve it. Perhaps the saint is cursed to return and ascend those in each branching reality forever. I myself believe that this final action was simply showing that the saint is still an animal, acting on instinct. It exists to ascend others, and so that is what it tries to do. Is the saint sent by the void worm? Was it the creation of an iterator? I'm not sure it matters. Throughout the game we've seen many timelines, from the iterators in their prime chatting away with each other, to a world where the only two we still know are barely holding on. We've seen the history of the ancients and learned of their hubris. I'm not sure there's an overarching lesson in this story, though there are many little things. Avoiding impulsivity, letting go of grudges, forgiving yourself for mistakes forgiving others for theirs. There are many moments in it that break my heart, yet still leave me hopeful. Perhaps the overarching lesson is that, not giving up hope despite a bad situation. A bad situation that continues to spiral more and more out of control. A situation that only improves when you stop shutting everyone out.